For nearly 50 years, a crazed villain known as the Joker has terrorized the Dark Knight, making the Joker's and Batman's feud one of pop culture's most popular and most recognizable hero-villain standoffs. But in 1988, a one-off graphic novel came out, which did the unthinkable. For the first time since 1939, it tells us just who on earth this dangerous evil villain is. Why does he look like a clown? And why is he so insane? In the novel, The Killing Joke, the visual story that is both visually stunning and terrifying as it asks a very tragic and dangerous question. Just where on earth does Batman and Joker's seemingly endless battle end? And at what consequences? The Killing Joke has gone on to become one of the most celebrated stories in the Dark Knight's long history, with some even claiming it to be the best tale, or at least the best Joker story to date. Its premise is a simple yet captivating one, as it's more of a disturbing look into the dangerous psyche of the Joker, along with just how cruel and inhumane he can be in order to try and bring people down to his level of insanity. To me, The Killing Joke is about insanity and going mad. It's about the struggle of not crossing into that line, into taking your mind into a dark place for which you will be forever lost. So today we are going to look into 10 things that you may not know about this haunting and tragic and often frightening story, The Killing Joke. So before we go all loony, let's check it out. Number 10, the first time the Joker is given a backstory. Yes, as mentioned, The Killing Joke does something no other comic writer had attempted to do beforehand, and that's explained just who on earth the Joker is, and how he came to be the way he is. Before 1988, I guess we were just meant to believe that he's some doofus who dresses up as a clown and robs banks while telling jokes. In fact, the Joker's backstory in The Killing Joke is just as tragic as Bruce Wayne slash Batman's origin story, drawing one of many parallels between the two, as we learn that the Joker was a failed stand-up comedian living in poverty with a pregnant wife, in which his wife and unborn child die in a faulty home appliance accident. And yes, I'm not kidding, that actually happens. Which leads the Joker to be caught working for some local thugs, in which a fool at a chemical factory leads him to his clown-like features, making it the final push for him to becoming completely consumed by all the tragedy in his life, and thus finally succumb to the terrifying bottomless pit of insanity. Number 9. Nostalgic Easter Eggs The graphic novel features several winks and nods to Batman and the Joker's history. For example, when Bruce Wayne is in the Batcave, we see pictures of the Joker from the 1940s and 50s. And shortly before the shocking and creepier than hell moment when the Joker turns up at the Gordon residence and shoots Barbara, we see Commissioner Gordon flick through old newspaper trimmings, where lo and behold, he comes across imagery from Batman's very first comic book appearance, Detective Comics number 27. Gordon even explains that this was the first time that they saw Batman. Along with the fact that the goons that the pre-clown Joker gets entangled with force him to take on the persona of the Red Hood, who is actually a villain made up of people the thugs are forced to work for them. Once again, a character stemming from Batman's past, who also in the comics turns out to be the Joker. Even the recent animated movie has winks and nudges to the past, as we see imagery inspired by both Jack Nicholson from the 1989 Batman movie and Heath Ledger from 2008's Dark Knight, among many others. It hits home and acts as a reminder that Batman and the Joker's bitter hatred of each other is something that has spawned throughout the decades. Number 8. The Genius Behind the Story The Killing Joke was written by Alan Moore. Moore is an acclaimed British comic book and graphic novel writer who has a long history of telling great classic stories and comic book panels. He started off writing for British comic strip 2000 AD, which was the home of Judge Dredd. 
where he would then make shifts to other mainstream comic enterprises, such as DC, where he would go on to pen masterpieces such as The Watchmen, Viva Vendetta, From Hell, and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Personally, I always find his stories to be haunting and thought-provoking, and explore the human condition, and how the human race tries to get it right, but more than often just downright gets things wrong. But hey, that's just my own interpretation of his work, and art, after all, is in the eye of the beholder. Number 7. Prequel So considering that The Killing Joke has gone on to become a classic story in the Batman mythos, it should come as no surprise that a prequel was written up. It was 2010 in The Brave and the Bold issue 33, in a story called Ladies Night. The premise is pretty basic and simple. Wonder Woman and Zatanna have premonitions of Batgirls aka Barbara Gordon's ill fate at the hands of the Joker. But being unable to prevent the events that are about to happen, they do the only thing they can do to help her by taking her out on a night on the town to do some dancing. And I mean lots and lots of dancing. I don't know, to me, the story and the whole nightclub vibe is kind of awkward. I guess it's a novel idea to try and link this story to the killing joke, but it's unnecessary, and the artwork doesn't even match the haunting artwork of the killing joke. I would say that this one is for hardcore fans of the killing joke, who just want to read it for sheer curiosity. Number 6, Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy return for the movie. In 2016, it was announced that an animated feature based on The Killing Joke was going to be released to the delight of many fans who couldn't wait to see a theatrical version of their favourite Batman Joker story. However, to put it kindly, the movie was not well received. I think the problem is the graphic novel is a visual experience. The first few pages of the story is told via morbid illustrations in the comic book panels. In other words, although the idea of making it into an animated movie may seem like a great idea, it's actually not designed to be converted into motion format. And the story is actually quite short and basic, which means in order for it to be put on film, the story had to be stretched out, aka padding, which is why we get that subplot at the start about Batgirl taking on gangsters, and her icy relations with Batman, and of course the cardinal sin that everyone felt betrayed both the characters and the stories, the subplot of Batman and Batgirl getting it on. Which, yeah, is unnecessary and cringy. However, one thing that you have got to give the movie credit for is the fact that it features both the talents of Mark Hamill, who voices the Joker. You're doing what any sane man in your appalling circumstances would do. You're going mad. And Kevin Conroy, who voices Batman. Because I've heard it before, and it wasn't funny the first time. Hamill and Conroy have been voicing the Joker and Batman since the early 90s, starting with the Batman animated series, and their contributions to their characters are just as loved and as celebrated as some of the live action ones. And let's face it, when it comes to voicing Batman and the Joker for The Killing Joke, no one else could do it but Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy. Number 5. Comic Disowning So as mentioned, the comic was written by Alan Moore, but unfortunately, the relationship between writer and graphic novel isn't as harmonious as you would hope it would be. As like some kind of father who's ashamed of his child's life's decisions, Moore has gone on to disown his own comic, despite the fact that everyone else seems to love it and give it worldwide praise. So where did it all go wrong? Well, apparently he had disagreements with the publishers at the time, but he has also expressed that it was way too violent and sexualized, and regarded it as, quote, a misstep on his part. And to be fair, there are some pretty morbid things that happen in the story, such as Barbara Gordon becoming paralyzed, and the more than hinted sexual assault and dehumanization of both Barbara and Jim. Basically, he felt it took the legacy of Batman into dark and troubled places that Batman doesn't belong. 
But to me, Batman is at its best when it's a dark and creepy story that makes you feel a little unnerved and a little unhinged. So hopefully one day Moore can make peace with his creation and realise it's actually a great work of art. Number four, Artist's Inspiration. The artwork of The Killing Joke was drawn up by British comic illustrator Brian Boland, who has had a long and successful career, who like Alan Moore started working on 2000 AD comics, where he illustrated for stories such as Judge Dredd, along with popular DC characters such as Wonder Woman and The Green Lantern. And I love his work on The Killing Joke. It's both beautiful but also terrifying at the same time. He manages to make something dirty and gritty look like an illustrated masterpiece. My two favourite illustrations in The Killing Joke is when Barbara answers a knock at the door to see the Joker pointing a gun at her. Her face pretty much sums up the confusion and ridiculousness of the situation. And the part where the Joker tells Gordon that he is going mad, with the giant imposing carnival in the background. It's scary, and kind of a visual way of suggesting that Gordon is trapped within the madness of the Joker itself, and his madness is big and powerful. This leads us to the look given to the Joker. Well, Bolan took inspiration for the visual design of the Joker from the 1928 movie, The Man Who Laughs. Namely, the performance of Conrad Veidt as Gwynplaine. Which is fitting, as this character from The Man Who Laughs was the inspiration for Batman co-creator Bob Kane to create the Joker in the first place. And in certain panels, you can clearly see Gwynplaine was indeed a creative influence. Number 3. Tim Burton is a huge fan. It should come as no surprise that Tim Burton was a huge fan of The Killing Joke. The visual director would go on to direct Batman in 1989, one year after The Killing Joke was published, and then Batman Returns in 1992. And Burton always maintained that he wanted to get away from the camp of the 60s TV show and to make Batman a dark, gothic visual experience. So maybe The Killing Joke was inspiration for Burton's vision of Batman. Burton stated it was the first comic he was able to read, as due to dyslexia, when he would read other comics, he didn't know which panel to go to and in which order. But because he was so invested in the story of The Killing Joke, he found it easier to follow and could clearly keep up with which panel was meant to be read first. And if you want further proof that Tim Burton loves The Killing Joke, then you need to look no further than the book's cover, as it has a quote from him right there that says, I love The Killing Joke, it's my favourite, it's the first comic I ever loved, right there. Number 2. The comic has changed over the years. In many ways, The Killing Joke is kind of like a George Lucas movie, in that it keeps having adjustments made and things changed and tweaked here and there. From colour saturation to font style on the covers, to downright changing the colour scheme altogether, earlier prints of the story had use of bright neon colours, which over the years have been removed to maintain the comic's dark and realistic feel. But the biggest, and in my opinion, the best changes made to the artwork of The Killing Joke was making the Joker's flashback scenes black and white, as opposed to before when they were in colour. It just makes it feel more timeless, and adds to the tragedy of the Joker's past. And it just seems more fitting in general. So, thanks to getting rid of all the bright neon colours, the comic has gone less Schumacher and more Burton. Number 1. The Joker Template As I already mentioned, for the first time in the history of Batman, the killing joke gives a backstory to the Joker, so he has purpose and motivation, rather than him just being a crazy guy dressed up as a clown. However, certain important traits of the Joker in The Killing Joke had been recycled in other mainstream Batman medias. For example, the idea that the Joker has his green hair, white skin and red lips due to falling in toxic chemicals was an idea that was reused the following year in 1989's Batman, where we see Jack Napier fall into chemicals. And in both stories, it happens at the hands of Batman, kind of making Batman responsible for his deformity. 
And a huge part of the subplot in The Killing Joke is that the Joker wants to bring people down to his level so they can enter a void of madness that he himself has entered with no return. In other words, he wants the dark side of people's nature to completely destroy their humanity. In The Killing Joke, the Joker had done this with Jim Gordon in an attempt to prove a point to Batman. But, once again, this is a subplot recycled for another Batman movie, in this case The Dark Knight, where the Joker makes Harvey Dent lose his humanity and succumb to the anarchy of revenge. In other words, reducing one of the most promising, optimistic figures of Gotham City to now be at the Joker's level. The Joker in The Dark Knight even tries to make the entire city turn on each other by taking away their humanity and try and force them to destroy each other. The fact that The Killing Joke helped influence two highly popular and successful Batman movies show just how powerful The Killing Joke is. Well guys, that was my look into The Killing Joke. I hope you enjoyed it and that it's motivated you to get out the graphic novel and read it all over again. Or, if you haven't read it yet, to find it and read it and experience it for yourself. Anyway, I'm Minty and it's quite possible that while watching this video, you've gone mad. See ya.